mentoring isn't a one-way uh, relationship. It's a two-way, it, it is a relationship. And it, the best, oh, by the way, the research shows the best ones are mutual and reciprocal in nature. In other words, there's learning that goes back and forth on these. Hello, hi, everyone. Welcome to another session on women, peace, and security, conversations with thought leaders hosted by the Daniel K. Noe Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. Today, my colleague, Dr. Al Shimkus, and I are, and I are joined by a very distinguished uh, panel. We have with us Dr. Dave Smith, who is the co-author of Athena Rising, How and Why Men Should Mentor Women, and he's also the co-author of the forthcoming book, Good Guys, How Men Can Be Better Allies for women in the workplace. And he's also an associate professor of sociology in the College of Leadership and Ethics at the US Naval War College. Welcome, Dr. Smith. We also have with us today, Ms. Sharon Feist, who's the first gender advisor to the commander United States Indo-Pacific Command, serving as the principal advisor on women, peace, and security with the um, within the Indo-Pacific. Also with us is Ms. Monica Herrera. She is the Women, Peace and Security Curriculum Developer at the US Indo-Pacific Command, where she supports the uh, Department of Defense implementation of the US strategy on WPS and the WPS Act of 2017 by mainstreaming gender perspectives into planning policies and programs at all levels. And finally, we have with us Dr. D. Sawyers, who joined the Women, Peace and Security team at the US Indo-Pacific Command as gender analyst. Dr. Sawyers conducts research and gender-based analysis to include the dimensions of political, social, economic, and security context in support of US Indo-PACOM policies and plans. Welcome to all of you once again. Thank you for giving us your time today. We especially invited um, Dr. Smith, who's based all the way on the East Coast at the US uh, Naval War College, because he has published on this topic extensively. And we, we also are very lucky to have Dr. Al Shimkus, who's worked with him. So before we start uh, some questions, Al, I would like you to please share some insights of your work experience with Dave and what what is his philosophy that you think or, and his attitudes toward gender at the workplace? Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, colleagues. Dave Smith and I go back a few years. Um, when I was on the faculty of the Navy War College, uh, Dave joined us from the US Naval Academy and he immediately um, began to influence how we deliver our educational product at the Naval War College. He brought with him a deep understanding of the sociological elements related to um, how women influence and sometimes not influence the leaders and decision makers. And what Dave did when he uh, joined the War College is bring rigor and bring uh, an, another academic interest into our sphere of political science at the War College. At the War College, we educate um, mid and senior leaders over a 10 month period. And one third of that time in um, Newport is spent in the National Security Affairs Department of which Dave was a faculty member. And as Dave began to understand our environment at the War College, having been a retired uh, Navy, Navy captain and a pilot, and then achieving his PhD in sociology, he brought to us as a faculty some real significant opportunities to craft our syllabus so that we were talking about the right things. And Dave brought with him a ability to influence across the, the syllabus in our intermediate and senior courses. And he um, was able to fundamentally change what we did in the initial part of our courses so that we were focusing on the right things at the right time for these men and women who are students to begin to think about the nature of their responsibility 
after they graduate from the War College, both civilian and military, and go back into leadership positions across the world, as we do have international officers joining us as well. Um, and so the exposure to the rigor that Dave brought made our uh, curriculum and overall educational product better for his influence. So Dave, what I'd like to do now is, is ask you uh, the first question, and which is, um, what influenced you to um, write your first book, um, Athena Rising? Well, thanks, Al, and, and thanks for the, you know, the, the really nice remarks about our time uh, at the Naval War College. Those were great times and we certainly miss having you there on faculty with us now. And um, I would just like to remind folks that Al was also responsible for bringing me to the Naval War College as well as his, it was his leadership that really, and we look at the, the development and the changes, the curriculum that we were working on there was very influential, as we all know, to have a supportive leadership in making significant change like this. But back to your question around the idea about why, you know, why do we focus in particular around um, the topic of men being better at and, and being more engaged in mentoring women? And, and this really goes back to the, you know, a lot of my own research and understanding some of the inequities that, that women face in the workplace. And, and certainly, even to this day, we, we still find that, that women are excluded, they're, they're not recruited in the same way, they're certainly not retained in the same way, promoted, advanced, um, and paid uh, the, with the gender equity, uh, pay equity gap still out there, you know, in the same way that men are. And it's interesting that when you ask men about this in particular, that some of them recognize that there are these gaps, these inequities about how women's experiences are very different in the workplace than men's, um, but many of them don't. Many of them don't see it. And, and part of the challenge, I think, in particular around some of the gender gaps that we have in the workplace is, is around acknowledging and, and seeing the problem. And, and so as I was uh, working with my, my good friend and colleague at the Naval Academy, Dr. Brad Johnson, and, and Brad's a clinical psychologist by training, uh, Brad's done all of his research over the years in the area of mentoring and mentoring relationship, what makes for great mentoring relationships and what we should be looking for in developing mentors. And we were talking about this, this particular area around how we could level the playing field in terms of, uh, if you think about it as professional developmental resources. Um, and, and that's everything from mentoring and coaching and sponsoring or advocacy. Um, and, and, and that gets to, again, it has real tangible differences in terms of how the women have access to this in the same way that men do. Um, there's also other sociodemographic uh, differences there as well. As you might imagine, we're focusing right here on, on a lens, gender lens perspective. And, and so we, we set out to do the research because it hadn't been done around cross-gender or, or looking at mentoring across difference and the difference here in this case being gender in particular. And, you know, we, we pulled together what was out there in terms of the best social science and behavioral science research. Um, but what was clear that there was something else that was missing from this. And it was interesting as we would talk to our female colleagues about what we were doing in, in terms of writing about uh, gender in the workplace and, and cross gender mentoring. And they would kind of look at us funny and say, well, you do know you're two dudes writing about women and gender in the workplace, right? <laughs> like, yeah, okay, we get it. That's, uh, but it was an important point that women's voices needed to be front and center um, as we were having these conversations, especially as two men writing about this to engage other men in doing this and doing it better. And so we set out to do the interviews for the book and we had the, you know, the great fortune to interview women across every industry. And, in particular, the military was was well represented with all the services and we had four star generals and, and admirals in some cases uh, for the women uh, where we had them to to be able to interview and, and to get a really, you know, their personal and their very first hand understanding of what worked well for them when it came to mentoring and if they had male mentors and what they wanted other men to know about this and what was most valued in that and what they wanted men to understand that uh, this is what worked and this is what you need to do more of and do better at in these particular areas. And then in many cases, we got a chance to interview the, the men who were these male mentors, very senior men in most cases, 
um, and learn from these men about what they, how they approached uh, mentoring across difference, in this case, gender, uh, what they learned from it. And it won't probably surprise you, these were, these, all of these men were very humble. Um, and, and in many cases, you know, they maybe even didn't even consider themselves to be mentors because they weren't in formal mentoring programs or pairings. Um, but they, but they all had, you know, a sense of how much they were able to learn as well from the, the relationship. And I think that's really important as we think about the qualities that go into these kinds of developmental relationships. So yeah, that was, uh, that, that got us from 2014 to the publishing in 2016. Very interesting, Dave. Thank Dave. you for sh sharing, um, your, uh, motivations and experience talking to all these senior, very senior uh, males and females and how they've benefited from the experience. How did men and women around the world respond to your research after it was published? That's, and that's a great question, Sarah. Thanks for, for asking, because I, I think it, it is interesting to see. And um, let me tell you, just from a military perspective for just a minute, because um, I think, you know, with our audience that will be listening to this, this is probably really interesting. And then I'll address maybe some other uh, industries and, and connected to the national security environment in particular. And what's really interesting with the military is that, you know, we expected there to be a lot of pushback and there really wasn't a lot. Um, that in many cases, men were very aware that there was a problem and they just didn't, they weren't really sure what to do about it. And, and they were looking for solutions. And, and I think that that was one of the things that many of them came up would tell us afterwards that um, as we were doing speaking and workshops with, with people across the, across the world on this topic, that they were, they were thankful that, hey, now I feel like I have a roadmap. I have a, a toolbox of, uh, of skills. And, and that's one of the things that we focused on with the book was to make it uh, very actionable, action-oriented, micro skills. Uh, matter of fact, we do a lot of workshops around skill development uh, for men in particular, um, but also for women. And, and understanding that, again, great mentorship uh, looks the same. Uh, it doesn't matter what the gender of the person who's doing the mentoring versus the person who's receiving the mentoring. And um, I think that there was, a, again, kind of a, a, a little bit of a relief that, oh, wow, so you're finally going to talk to us about how the fact that now we have more women in the military and that we're going to have various kinds of professional relationships with them, what those things look like and why maybe in many cases we were reluctant or a little anxious about those relationships to begin with. And we can begin to, to kind of get past that and, and really get into the, the meat of what the, the relationship's all about. And that's about, again, developing uh, people and, and helping them to reach their career goals and their career dreams out there. So it, in general, it was very positive. I will tell you that there were some, uh, there was some pushback, and and it come it came in a couple different varieties. And one, um, probably no surprise that there are, I think, from an ideological perspective, there are, in, in especially in very traditional industries and professions where there's just a belief that, um, again, that in some cases women don't belong, or that they that men and women shouldn't be spending time together. And the, you know, in, in very close quarters, like the, these types of relationships demand and require to, to get the most out of those relationships. Um, it doesn't help when sometimes senior government leaders will speak out and say things like, well, I don't think it's acceptable or appropriate for, for men and women to, to get together and have dinner or have a conversation over dinner if it's not their, you know, for the man, if it's not his wife or his spouse in that case. And those kinds of things are not generally helpful. And they're, they're again, they might have been okay in 1920, but this is 2020. And again, we've moved, we're moving into a very different workplace. And, and certainly in terms of the, uh, again, the diversity of our, our workforce and the talent that we need in that workforce out there. So there was some of that. There was also, I think, getting back to my earlier point about the lack of understanding of what the gap is, and that there were a lot of men who felt like, wait a minute, we have women we work with, we have integrated units and squadrons and ships and battalions. Why are we even talking about this today? We are so far past this. And, but it just spoke to the fact that they didn't understand or see the inequities, the gaps that are still existing in there for, for women and how disconnected in some cases they were from what was really going on. And they were 
in most cases, very quickly corrected by their by their peers, which was always kind of nice to hear other people speak up about the what they weren't seeing out there. And so I think that's a that's an interesting part of it. But I, the overwhelming, I think there was a, a sense of uh, finally we're, we're talking about this in a way that gets to professional relationships that we we know we have to have, but nobody's ever really spent a lot of time talking to us about how to do this and do it well. Uh, th thank you, Dave. <clears throat> For our Indo-PACOM team, how does the notion of men as mentors and enablers of women relate to women, peace and security as it is relevant to Indo-PACOM? Thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Shimkus. And first, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank um, APCSS and Dr. Yaman and Dr. Shimkus for hosting us today. Um, we're also thrilled and honored to be on the same uh, co-interview with Dr. Dave Smith. Um, and particularly, his book is often cited by a lot of our senior leadership on Athena Rising, um, How and Why Men Should Mentor Women. Um, and it is really salient to sort of the gender dynam dynamics within the military but also to the Women, Peace and Security program. Um, so as far as your question, um, how do the, uh, the notion of men as mentors and enablers of women relate to the global women, peace and security agenda? Um, I think it's important first to recognize that both men and women have multifaceted contributions to make in advancing the women, peace and security agenda and also gender equality as a whole. And for those in our audience who don't know, um, when I refer to the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, I'm referring to UN Security Council Resolution 1325, mm -hmm. which was passed unanimously 20 years ago. Um, and it was the first resolution to recognize first the disproportionate impact of conflict on women and girls, but also second, recognizing their undervalued and um, underutilized contribution to meaningful um, peace and security. Um, so again, back to the question, if you're going to advance these type of principles, um, principles especially on women's meaningful participation at all ranks and all levels within the military, you first have to recognize the system in which you're operating in, um, as well as be very deliberate about whom you engage with. Um, for the defense sector, which we know is predominantly male, um, I think it's important to engage male counterparts across the continuum um, to solicit the support needed to improve the system, which is really to reduce gender um, inequities. And that means engaging men as allies, as champions, as mentors, as enablers of um, Women, Peace and Security, which I'll refer to as WPS. Um, and each of those roles may look different um, depending on that person. And I was just reading an article earlier by Dr. Dave Smith um, in the Harvard Business Review and he cited uh, Jennifer Brown, which is a, she's a diversity consultant, um, well known. And she frames, um, and I'm gonna quote her here, male allyship on a continuum ranging from apathetic, which is clueless and disinterested regarding gender issues, to aware, so it has um, some grasp for the issues, but not at all active or engaged, to active, which is well-informed and willing to engage in gender equity efforts, but only when asked, and then to advocate, um, which is to advocate, which is routinely and proactively championing um, gender inclusion. And we address this in our gender advisor training, which we provide um, and teach the importance of having a gender perspective. And we underscore at the very least that our military operations must be gender sensitive, which is falls in the category of gender aware. Um, but we hope for our military, our analysis, our policies, our planning and our assessments um, to be gender responsive. And even further in an ideal state to be um, gender transformative. And we have an opportunity with the Department of Defense's um, Women, Peace and Security uh, Strategic Framework and Implementation Plan, which was just released two months ago. Um, and it has the potential to be transformative. So DOD's holistic approach um, will lead to a unifying policy that codifies best practices um, to further support our national security objectives. And really the end goal is to integrate WPS as a strategic enabling theme throughout all of our activities vice a separate discrete concept, um, quote unquote, women's issues. Um, and that basically means that DOD men and women have an equally important role to play um, in WPS implementation. It is a strengths-based approach, um, relying upon our own individual unique expertise and our insights um, so that the security outcomes that we hope to achieve are both inclusive um, and sustainable. 
Thank you, Sharon. That was very well articulated. Um, very clear that uh, this topic is very relevant to U.S. Indo-PACOM and the DOD. Now, my question is for all of you. Uh, we've talked a little bit about individual and organizational attitudes towards men mentoring women. What about culture? Does culture play a role? Sarah, I really like this question uh, because it touches on the fact that gender is socially constructed which means that groups of people create a shared meaning about something. So in the case of gender, societies uh, create a shared understanding of what it means to be a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl. And unpacking gender means understanding all the roles, rights, responsibilities, and behaviors that are expected of men and women, as well as those normative relationships that exist between men and women within any given social context. So kind of to, to get to your question, um, yes, you know, because as a social construct, conceptions about gender vary across time, geographic space, and across cultures as well, certainly, which means that mentoring relationships between men and women are also likely to vary. But I think it's also important to recognize that culture is extremely nuanced. So in our coursework, we really emphasize the importance of suspending your assumptions about certain cultures, and especially our assumptions about the way one culture might view gender, um, because culture is not immutable either. So we um, teach and, and emphasize conducting a gender analysis to help provide a more thorough examination uh, within kind of the broader context of another culture. And that can really help us better understand how the gender landscape writ large might shape our specific engagements or our understanding of the kinds of norms we see in the institutions that we're working with. Um, so to get back to your question, uh, you know, even within a single culture, the practice of men mentoring women might be viewed differently depending on the context. Um, Sharon, I don't know, maybe you can speak to some more specifics. Sure, thank you. And I would say that it is actually pretty challenging to find specific examples uh, related to cultural examples related to uh, men mentoring women. Um, so I'm actually more of the examples that we kind of saw um, tended to showcase more of a mixed mentorship model um, or we found examples that it was just solely or narrowly highlighting women mentoring only women um, but i'm going to use a model of an, a more recent example for us so in mongolia for instance um, it's a nation with rel relatively higher gender parity um, but according to the world bank there are less women in senior decisions uh, making decisions um, despite the fact that urban women um, actually have higher post-secondary degrees than men and actually are more form are better equipped to work with informal employment. Um, Mongolia on the national level um, has also just demonstrated a strong commitment to gender equality. They have a national committee on gender equality and they also have a national law um, on gender equality. Um, but of course, we still see, as in many countries, a gap in women's representation, uh, again, at that senior level. Um, but also a gap between uh, rural women versus urban women, uh, specifically in their access to education um, and employment opportunity, uh, to opportunities. Um, so we've been actually working with a Mongolian NGO um, that aims to close that gap and promote gender equality. They're called the Zorg Foundation, and they are founded after a really prominent, renowned uh, Mongolian statesman, statesman male. Um, and they kind of employ a mixed gender, uh, mixed model of women and men mentoring women. Um, and we've been working that with through them with um, US Army Pacific as well, um, specifically on two programs. Um, the first is a rural women's change maker program, and that's designed to provide leadership training to Mongolian rural women. And second, through the women's mentorship program, and that's a training designed for Mongolian women serving in the armed forces, um, as well as other areas of government. And both of these type of programs have a mix of male and female um, instructors and mentors. Um, so in this particular context that I'm giving, it's not simply a binary of males mentoring females or vice versa. It's more of a mixed hybrid model to promote really institutional capacity building. I can add just a couple of things from our own research. Um, and again, these vary 
these vary quite a quite a bit when it comes to you know we think about cross cultural perspectives. But back to I think Monica, one of the things Monica brought up here was this idea around assumptions, and so this gets also to bias and and uh, different kinds of implicit associations or perceptions we have of people. And so this is one of the things that came up in a variety of different settings for us is one of the reasons that sometimes men didn't understand they, they were even doing it was they had imp these implicit perceptions about women and who they were and whether or not they, uh, again, were going to invest time and resources. So for example, if men hold a, uh, a bias or a perception about women that, that, that they are not strong enough or that they're not leadership material in some way, or that they're a risky investment, that she's a flight risk, uh, and, and we did have a lot, a lot of men talk about it that way, that they're, they're probably not going to invest in them the same kind of time and resources that they would with somebody else. And so perceptions played out in a, in a large way there. The other part is around uh, other assumptions that we make. And again, even, and I'll just give you one quick example of, of a very senior man in this case, who was the uh, acting administrator of NASA at the time. And he was telling us about how he thought, you know, he was one of the male mentors that we had a chance to interview and his, uh, his mentee was the deputy director of the Kennedy Space Center. And, and so we have some very senior people here within the government. And he said that uh, he considered himself to be kind of a, a gender savvy guy, you know, he kind of got it and he understood and he was, he could see, you know, when there were things not going the way they were supposed to. And he gave us an example of when he was on a hiring committee, they were at the very last uh, set of decisions to be made before an offer was going to be made. And there were four candidates left and there was one woman and she was by far and very clearly the, the best candidate for the job. And before they were getting ready to, to decide to make the offer to her, he, he said that he, he felt like he had to say something here and speak up, you know, being this gender savvy dude that he was, that, um, hey, you know, this job requires a lot of travel. And, you know, she just had a baby about three weeks ago. Um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe she's not, this isn't the right fit for her. And he said, fortunately for him, that there was a woman on the committee and she was sitting right across the table from him with kind of flames coming out of his eye, out of her eyes at him. And, and she said, uh, Robert, uh, first, I, I think she's a pretty smart woman. Uh, she applied for the job and she probably knows that it requires a lot of travel. And, and two, um, I'm pretty sure she knows she had a baby three weeks ago. So why don't we just let her make that decision? And he was like, ah, this light bulb moment, right? This epiphany. It's like, wow, here I was thinking I was this gender savvy guy who kind of got it and was speaking up and doing the right thing. And I totally missed it. Um, and, and so he said, you know, sometimes along the way, we have to begin to think, we have to challenge our assumptions or have others hopefully help us to see our blind spots and help us to challenge these assumptions that in some cases we think we understand, but we really don't. And we're not making the best decisions for our people and our organizations out there. Thank you, Dave. I'd like to go off script here just a moment because some of the things that uh, Monica and Sharon mentioned and then Dave, you alluded to, I would like to drill down a moment into thinking about bias, but more specifically about open-mindedness in relationship to the senior leader who may be a man in relationship to the Mongolia situation that Sharon brought up. Did you find Sharon within the context of your, of your understanding of what occurred and is occurring in Mon Mongolia? that there was a certain open-mindedness demonstrated by those senior leaders who are seemingly, at least by a description, empowering uh, gender equality? Thank you, that's actually a, a great question. And I'd say by and large, I mean, on a national level, uh, Mongolia is very committed to gender equality. I mentioned before, they have legisl legislation and they do prioritize that. But when you see it sort of trickle down, um, it became very apparent, even from the Mongolian women we spoke with um, who are in the room, that they don't have access um, to those senior decision-making levels. Uh, so when it actually starts to trickle down from the mid-career um, and lower, we don't see um, that opportunity um, to rise. So I think um, there's definitely an, a strong interest, and I do think Mongolian women have been and are continuing to make the case 
of why um, gender equality matters and that um, sort of advancement of their perspectives at senior decision levels will make um, basically Mongolia more of a peaceful and stable country. Um, I would say it's a work in progress, but I mean, by and large, they are more advanced than in other countries as far as um, gender equality, yet we're still seeing very similar um, type of issues kind of cross-cutting. Thank you very much, Sharon. Yeah. Al, can I add to that? Please. Yeah, so that's a great question. And one of the things we found both in the research for our Athena Rising and for Good Guys is that, you know, open-mindedness as you're referring to it here is, is certainly a characteristic or trait that is um, helpful as we think about men that have a different, or more, maybe I would just say a more inclusive perspective in particular of gender, but probably extends beyond gender as well. And, you know, part of it is that they have, in some cases, it's part of how they were socialized. In other cases, it was part of a, maybe something that was kind of, again, one of these very um, important experiences in their lives, or it might have been a really influential person in their life as well that, that got them to this open-mindedness. Um, but in, in, in all these cases, they, we, they have what we would say is a much less of a hierarchical approach to relationships broadly and much more of a uh, egalitarian or, or power down, you know, reducing power dynamics that tend to be inherent in all relationships out there. Um, so they're not as, as focused on that. And I would, I would tell you that um, this open-mindedness comes from, as I mentioned before, we found in our newest research on uh, allies in particular about men who, who are actively involved in solving different gender inequities, including mentoring. Um, that they had three kind of motivations to do this work. And one is that personal connection, right? And that's the, uh, it might've been an important family member. It could have been an important person, colleague or peer or mentor or mentee, but somebody who shared that experience with them and, and it really kind of opened their eyes and it got, in, it gets in touch with people's sense of fairness and justice. And that's really something that we, we see really kind of begins to motivate people to take action. And that's what this is all about. It's not about talk, it's about action. And so that's one. And the, the second one is just, I think from a WPS perspective, this is critical that we focus on this from a, from a mission effectiveness or an outcome-based perspective. And, and we have to continually keep this tied to that. And, and again, because if leaders, uh, in this case, you know, if we're talking about men, to get, keep them involved and engaged in this work, we, they've got to see that it's connected to who they are as a leader and their organization or their, the effectiveness of doing the job. And I think that's critical to this. Um, the, the last motivation we found was that around altruism, no, no surprise there, that social justice warriors and, and altruistic people in particular, this kind of comes naturally to them. The, uh, the one story that I, I would give you here that I think kind of makes the case for WPS that's so important, and I apologize that it's not in an Indo-PACOM uh, perspective, but, and this is on AFRICOM, but um, we had the the opportunity to interview uh, Ambassador Donald uh, Steinberg, and and if you don't know Ab Admiral or sorry, Ambassador Steinberg, he is a he is one of these gender equity advocates and allies out there, and he is doing he's doing the work to engage men in this work. But he told us that the story in particular that got him going on this really important that opened his eyes was really around when he was a special envoy to Angola during the peace process, and. They, the, the peace process kept falling apart uh, and he couldn't figure out why. And, and they looked back and, and somebody, had, you know, a reporter had actually asked him afterwards said, you know, is this, did you take gender into account? And he's like, oh yeah, absolutely. This is a gender neutral process that we're doing here. And they thought about it months later and he said, you know, that was kind of a stupid thing to say because we, that meant we did not take gender into account at all. And he said that became very apparent to him as the, um, the process kept falling apart and it was because they couldn't predict and they didn't have the intel and the information to know where the next violation to the peace treaty was going to come from. And the reason they didn't know it was is because the people that had that information were women and women were not part of the process at any level of, of the peace process, all the way down to the people that were implementing it on the ground who knew because if they, they knew that in the marketplaces is where the information was and women were the ones who were in the marketplace and they were the ones who had that. And he said, hey, from now on, there is no way we can do this without having women involved at every single level. So thanks for letting me share that. Thank you, Dave. I think it's an important example. And although it's within um, the 
the AFRICOM AOR, there are probably similar examples in the Indo-PACOM AOR. So for our Indo-PACOM folks and for Dave, um, could you identify a across the spectrum, across the AOR barrier that would prevent um, your vision of um, women, peace and security coming to fruition? Is there any specific arenas in which you address that you see as um, not allowing this to, to come to fruition? I'll, I'll start with this one. And um, I think it, I'm going to hearken back to kind of what Dave would just, was just talking about. Um, I think one of the barriers is a sort of assumption that things are gender neutral, especially in the security sector, when in fact, um, if you're not doing a gender analysis, if you're not actually uh, you know, really deconstructing what gender has to offer to insight on security, then it's not gender neutral, it's gender blind. And so that's certainly a barrier. And um, actually, our Secure Future um, recently published a really excellent policy brief outlining uh, some of the unique challenges for women um, in the maritime sector. And so in, in the Indo-Pacific, right, over 70% of this region is, is covered by water. So a huge part of the security sector is in the maritime domain. Um, but in this policy brief, um, you know, they, they sort of highlighted this, this concept of because the sector kind of views itself as gender neutral, there isn't necessarily as much acknowledgement that, you know, WPS agenda, that gender perspectives need to be deliberately um, implemented. And, uh, but there, there, that's also ripe opportunity, you know, like the first, Women in Maritime Association um, was established in this re in, in the Indo-Pacific in Fiji in 2005, and women play really important roles throughout the maritime space. So um, I think you know it's important to acknowledge their impact, um, and that's you know by reinforcing and kind of amplifying their existing participation. So again, I think that's certainly an area ripe with opportunity for mentorship. Um, and I think also kind of going back to, to something Dave was talking about earlier, um, the research is really clear that gender equality improves security outcomes. So, you know, I think the, fir the, the first major opportunity is for, for men to recognize this and acknowledge not only can they be a part of the solution, but if they're truly concerned about the security of their communities, societies, uh, and even states, that it's really their responsibility as security practitioners to use their influence toward positive change. And I think mentoring within the security sector is, is certainly you know, one excellent avenue to do this, especially acknowledging that the security sector globally um, you know, it is, predominantly male, right? Men occupy positions at all levels and in far greater number. Um, they occupy positions of decision-making authority, certainly at disproportionately higher rates. Um, and that's really at the heart of why the international WPS agenda exists, right? Recognizing the urgent need to meaningfully include women in every space where conversations about security are taking place. And um, so I, I just think the whole, kind of the whole agenda in and of itself um, and, and the research that we've seen over the past uh, few decades really lends itself um, to kind of empowering men, right? To, uh, to help implement WPS for kind of greater, more holistic, human-centered approaches to security. So I, I think it's an opportunity for sure. You mean the good guys, right? Yeah, of course. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Very well said. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to this dialogue. And as I was listening, I was thinking, well, sounds like, you know, some men have been very deliberate about mentoring women, but a lot of these women have to rely on men uh, who they might have had a connection with, a strong work relationship. They've had perhaps a uh, you know, something in common with them. How can we advance a culture, organizational culture, where men are more deliberate about broadening their mentorship activities so that it goes beyond those special connections or special guys 
who are just good guys? How, can we, how do we make it part and parcel of our organizations? I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll um, discuss this a little bit. You know, a lot of um, what we do at the headquarters, why we have a WPS program in an office now to begin with, um, is because you do need to dedicate some resources towards implementation. And we focus a lot on institutionalization and a process called gender mainstreaming, uh, which is, you know, really looking at all of the policies, programs, guidance, everything that comes out and doing a level of analysis to um, help determine where are some of the gaps and where can we deliberately build this kind of bake it into the system. That's the true institutionalization. And, and there's a whole, um, one of the three objectives in our US strategy on WPS is you know, building institutional capacity, both within our own organizations and then um, taking it out to our partners and allies and, and kind of encouraging that with them as well. And the other key point I think to that is uh, you have to have an assessment, monitoring, and evaluation framework to determine, um, you know, a baseline and then work towards uh, an outcome. And so I'll turn it over to Dr. Sawyers, who's our analyst and um, who's really working to, to build that kind of framework uh, for us. Uh, thanks, Monica. Thank you. Uh, I was struck by, first off, thank you, Dr. Smith, for writing the book and having the insights to even broach the topic. I think that's extraordinary and I deeply appreciate that. And I did enjoy uh, reading your book. And as I was reading your book, I could not help but uh, have personal reflections from really uh, over 30 years in the military. So um, quite extraordinary experience. And I, um, I saw something on social media the other day that really hit home for me. And it says something like, you can't intimidate me. I used to hold the flashlight for my dad. And uh, I really had a uh, recollection of how that was like uh, for me, the opportunity to be a part of something, to be a part of uh, a mechanical effort to fix the car or to look underneath the house and uh, inspect the wiring or something that was vitally important to the home that I was a part of. I was ill-equipped for that experience, but I felt like I had something to contribute. And uh, that same kind of experience then is reflected in my military career as well. So uh, social institutions do provide opportunities for mentors if they take advantage of the rules and the regulations and fearlessly apply those to how they manage their resources and build their capability. Uh, when we uh, think back on our own mentorship experiences, I had three really good mentors in the Army. The first one told me that uh, I was in fact skilled uh, I was the only one available and I had to be company commander. And so it was like, a, a, you're the only one that can do it, uh, you're needed. So I was needed to hold the flashlight. Uh, the second mentor um, reassigned me from a dead end position because he took the time to read personnel files. He was a good human resource developer. He was building a bench for uh, medical uh, logisticians and planners. And so he selected me for that position. So again, that shows that utilizing personnel mechanisms and recruitment opportunities in institutions are there for a reason. And they're really there and applicable to everybody on the team. They can be utilized by everybody. Doesn't, uh, reply, uh, doesn't really require formal, like you said, a lot of mentorship is informal and a lot of mentorship can take place within the institutional configuration that we find ourselves. Uh, my third mentor, um, it was in force structure design and uh, capability building. And we were all a part of the team, unbelievable uh, resources and fellowships, internships, temporary duty assignments, deployments, um, additional duties as executive officer that taught me a lot about uh, the um, personnel mechanisms and the required paperwork, all things that built 
um, built skills for me and uh, confidence. So I was actually then a valued flashlight holder in the end of my uh, military career because of the really informal mentorship that I received in an institutional framework. We're up to our last question. And um, the question is related to um, interesting and success stories that would allow some gravitas to um, our discussion. Both Dave and Sharon mentioned um, success stories by definition in relationship to the importance of inclusion. Are there any others within Indo-PACOM that you could cite as uh, situations in which this is really working? And we have the, the organization valuing their personnel, regardless of gender. So an immediate example that comes to mind, uh, we're very fortunate within our program that we do actually have gender champions, both male and female in senior leader positions, um, and who understand, again, um, the military operational effectiveness of why the WPS agenda matters. Um, so that's within our own um, directorate within the J9. Um, our director has been a champion. Um, he's also carried the message um, to a lot of our international um, counterparts, and it makes a difference. And I can just give a, a quick example. When we were in Mongolia, to use this example again, um, I was supposed to be on a panel participating with other esteemed Mongolian women to talk about women, peace, and security, but we made a last-minute decision change to put Dr. Wood up there because the messenger um, very, and the delivery mattered in this case because it was in a plenary session. It was a mixed gender balanced audience of um, men and women, Mongolian armed forces. So while the message remained the same, the messenger, the delivery mattered. And it was actually more powerful to have Dr. Wood um, convey the message of why women, peace and security matters to the Mongolian armed forces. Um, and then again, we also have, um, you know, direct connection with Major General Susie Verislam, who's the mobilization assistant uh, to commander. And she has been um, kind of a, a powerful and key ally um, for us as well. So we've, we've been fortunate to have, I think, both um, male and female senior leaders as champions and advocates for our work. Dave, anything from your view that would uh, demonstrate it's, it's really working when one puts their um, efforts into doing the right thing? Yeah, I would, I would say that, you know, I've worked with several different organizations that have had, um, I would call them kind of a semi-structured formal program because they, there was a program in, in terms of matching or, or helping to, to find high potential talent within the organization and then find, again, matching uh, mentors for them. But um, a, across the I think across the board with all of those, what was interesting was in what we find with, again, today with extremely large organizations out there and, and certainly like with Indo-PACOM where we can find ourselves spread out across large distances and not be in person a lot as well, um, that, you know, mentoring doesn't have to always be in person and it doesn't always have to be in a formal program. And I think we've heard that over and over again today. And it doesn't always have to be somebody who's senior to you either. Um, it could be a peer as well. And so that was one of the interesting things that we found with this, these programs also was um, they in particular focused on having people from different parts, different uh, parts of the organization. So you might have somebody from J7 who's mentoring somebody in, in J3, right? And, and in various parts of the organization. And that way, there was also this cross-functional piece to it, which is really important about learning and how we can both learn. And to me, this is really kind of key in understanding that mentoring isn't a one-way uh, relationship. It's a two-way, it, it is a relationship. And it, the best, oh, by the way, the research shows the best ones are mutual and reciprocal in nature. In other words, there's learning that goes back and forth on these. And, you know, I think in particular that came out in our interviews that we did, almost every senior male mentor that we talked to told us by the end of the interview, and we didn't ask them this, but they said, you know, I feel a little guilty about this mentoring relationship. And we're like, why? It sounded like it was really beneficial. And they're like, yeah, but I think I got way more out of it than she did. And it really speaks to how these men had, there was a lot of, uh, I would say, cultural humility in the terms of 
I didn't make a, an assumption about because she's a woman, she must need or want this. Um, it also got to their learning orientation, this openness, right? Uh, Open-mindedness that we talked about earlier, that they were willing to learn and be open to learning from them. And the really interesting part of this is that the benefits for mentors, and in this case, for male mentors, and it works the other direction too, by the way, but for men in particular who are, who are mentoring women is they are getting increased access to information, other parts of the organization they wouldn't otherwise had, right? Makes you, again, a more uh, effective leader. We see that they're gonna have wider, uh, more diverse networks, both internal to the organization and external. And again, you can see this from a collaboration and a cooperation perspective. This is really important across the AOR. And then I think finally, at a more micro perspective, that we found that these men had better interpersonal skills, right? So more EQ, more empathy, and who doesn't want more of that in our leaders today? <clears throat> and the best part of that is that, you know, when you go home, you don't check that at the door, you, know, you get to take that home with you. And we find that it makes them better partners and spouses and parents when they go back too. So lots of great benefits. We tend to focus on the mentees, but there's such great benefits for the mentor. And of course, we, we know that there's incredible benefits for the organization broadly. Fascinating to listen to you. Thank you for your insights, uh, Dr. Smith and uh, my colleagues from US Indo PACOM. We've really enjoyed this discussion and uh, we're really looking forward to Dr. Smith's next book, which is Good Guys How Men Can Be Better Allies for Women in the Workplace. Uh, thank you for sharing some of your um, research with us today and, um, and for all the great work you've done. Um, I can tell listening to the Indopaycom uh, team that Athena Rising has been very impactful. We're equally very grateful to the Indopaycom team of gender advisors, Ms. Sharon Feist, Ms. Monica Herrera, and Dr. Dee Soares, you're doing very important work. And we continue, uh, we look forward to continuing our work together with you. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Shimkus and I are very grateful for your time and we look forward to seeing you again maybe in another session very soon.